Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Although I am sure many of you have already had quite enough Willa Cather on this channel this week, I have a few more videos to go. I had the great pleasure of buddy reading her novel, A Lost Lady, published exactly 100 years ago, I believe, with the very thoughtful reader Sarah of the wonderful channel Hardcover Hearts. Rather than filming a Zoom conversation, we conversed on Voxer. And although The Lost Lady is a very slim book that would be easy to read in one sitting, we split our conversation into two sessions, one about each part of the novel. And personally, I am thrilled that we did that. Cather's story relies on a real sense of rupture or time passing between the two sections. And although I tend to like to read books in single gulps when I can, it was a great experience separating this one into two pieces and doing a bit of thinking about the first part and even a bit of guessing about what would happen next before moving forward. This novel is quite different from the Prairie novels that Cather wrote right before this one, especially O Pioneers and My Antonia are about rural life in the plains of Nebraska. In A Lost Lady, we find ourselves in a very different kind of community, a slightly more established town developed partly by the development of the railroad and about people who are not pioneer farmers, but business people and lawyers. We also see a change in the kind of female character we get. Marion Forrester is a lady, as the title says, not the image of the adventurous and independent strong young women, immigrants to America, whom we meet in O Pioneers and My Antonia. Unlike them, she doesn't have much of a sense of vocation or a sense of purpose in the ways that I think both Antonia and perhaps especially Alexandra do. Marion instead seems to be the treasure in need of care and attention from men, a woman who chooses to play up not her strength and liveliness, but her femininity and her aristocratic status. There are similarities, though. Like in My Antonia, Cather here again tells the story primarily from the perspective of a young man, Neil, who at the start of the book is just a boy, one who very much admires Marianne and her sophistication. I want to read you a few bits from the very beginning of the book. It starts out, 30 or 40 years ago, in one of those gray towns along the Burlington Railroad, which are so much grayer today than they were then, there was a house well known from Omaha to Denver for its hospitality and for a certain charm of atmosphere. The house sounds almost like a house of ill repute, a whorehouse, doesn't it? But this is the house of the Foresters, and Captain Forrester, Marion's husband, is one of the members of the railroad aristocracy, as Cather refers to the directors and superintendents and other high-level employees, people, quote, whose names we all knew. And the men who came to visit were his fellow employees in the railroad aristocracy. Cather immediately lays out the class issues that run throughout this book. There were two distinct social strata in the prairie states, the homesteaders and handworkers who were there to make a living, and the bankers and gentlemen ranchers who came from the Atlantic seaboard to invest money and to develop our great west, as they used to tell us. These businessmen found it agreeable, as Cather says, to stop by as they passed through town and spend the night at the Forester's house, a place where, quote, their importance was delicately recognized. That subtle suggestion of a house of ill repute doesn't disappear. Marion, 25 years younger than her railroading husband, deliberately tries to make the male visitors feel at home. Male visitors would leap nimbly to the ground and run up the front steps as Mrs. Forrester came out on the porch to greet them. Even the hardest and coldest of his friends, a certain narrow-faced Lincoln banker, became animated when he took her hand, tried to meet the gay challenge in her eyes, and to reply cleverly to the droll word of greeting on her lips. She was always there, 
just outside the front door to welcome their visitors, having been warned of their approach by the sound of hooves and the rumble of wheels on the wooden bridge. If she happened to be in the kitchen, helping her bohemian cook, she came out in her apron, waving a buttery iron spoon, or shook cherry-stained fingers at the new arrival. She never stopped to pin up a lock. She was attractive in dishabille, and she knew it. She had been known to rush to the door in her dressing gown, brush in hand, and her long black hair rippling over her shoulders to welcome a visitor. I focused on this short first chapter because the tension between ladylike and the overtly flirtatious is a theme that recurs in this book, and one I'll come back to in a minute. I said earlier that this book is told primarily through the eyes of the young man, Neil, and we flash back in time in chapter two, and for the first time we realize that we're seeing what's happening, at least partly, through his eyes. The narrative is in third person, but the perspective is usually much more limited to what Neil can understand as he looks back on the story during his life. I even think one could argue that chapter one could also be his vision of the story, but Cather doesn't make that clear. Anyway, in this chapter, a group of young boys have come to picnic on the lovely lawn of the forester's house and to go fishing in the marsh there. Soon the boys are joined by an older boy, Ivy, who immediately cast a malevolent tone. One of the younger boys even calls him Poison Ivy. Eventually, he shows off his skill by using his slingshot to knock a woodpecker out of a nearby tree. He doesn't intend to kill it. Instead, he commits a horrifying act of abuse against it slicing into both of its eyes and then watching it try to fly, circling about in the air with no sense of what to do. With the desire to put the bird out of its misery, Neil finds a way up the tree, but then falls to the ground injured. The boys decide to transport him to the house where Mrs. Forrester can help take care of him. Both of these scenes happen in the first 15 pages or so of the book, and I think that combined, the scenes introduce us to the important characters and give us some idea of the general tone of the book and lay out the major themes that will circle throughout this book. The imagery of falling, both the bird and the boy, is repeated elsewhere, from the captain falling off of his horse to Marion experiencing a fall while hiking. And in addition to all this imagery, the title even suggests that what we're going to be reading is the story of a fallen woman. During our Buddy Read discussion, Sarah pointed out that there's a line in the book that describes Marion as a bird caught in a net. I hope she'll talk about this on her own channel, because she made a fascinating comment about how the wording reminded her a bit of the writing of Toni Morrison, where Morrison starts a phrase that might suggest one idea, a bird, freedom, but then in the end of the phrase transforms the image. What would have been free is constrained. I think that just adds so much resonance to the image, and it reminded me of another literary bird caught in a net, the statement Jane Eyre makes in Charlotte Bronte's book, I am no bird, and no net ensnares me. I'm a free human being with independent will. But Marion is no Jane Eyre. Instead of expressing her independent will, she finds a way to live within that net, and to find a way to survive living in that net. While we're talking about connections or comparisons to other literature, I do want to mention that Cather seems to me to be directly responding to some classic fallen woman novels, such as Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina, The Awakening, and others. I think Cather might have aligned herself instead with Nathaniel Hawthorne's tale of an adulteress who found a way to go forward, perhaps perversely in some ways, instead of the traditional literary end of adulterous women. I'm being a bit cagey here, but I hope those of you who are particularly interested in the various ways authors have used this trope might add this book to your list of adultery novels if you haven't read it before. 
I think there might be a different kind of fall here too, not just the physical falls and Marion's fall, but Neil's own loss, his loss of faith and high regard of her. As he continues to mature, he simply leaves her behind, and she becomes sort of a small part of his memory almost, even though he also recognizes that she helped transform him into an adult. He is ready to condemn her to the past, even getting a bit irritated that she doesn't just die with her husband during the pioneer years to which she belonged. When I was talking to Sean the Book Maniac about my Antonia, I asked him if Jim Burden was an unreliable narrator. He very rightly pointed out that everyone is just telling their own story, and that he doesn't use that term anymore. I like that very much, but I still think there's something that happens when an author writes a book with a character's perspective that we readers are supposed to question. I finished this book thinking that Cather might not be as judgmental of the lost lady as Neil eventually becomes. And one more comparison with another piece of literature, Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby, which came out immediately after The Lost Lady. Let me say first that Fitzgerald actually wrote to Cather and apologized, fearing that he might have accidentally plagiarized a paragraph in her book. She said she didn't interpret it that way. But there is a larger similarity, not plagiarism in any way, that's not what I mean, But just as Neil is an outsider, looking at Mrs. Forrester sort of from afar, Nick Carraway is a distanced narrator who looks at Daisy with both great interest and a fair amount of disdain and dismissal. Well, that will do it for today. I want to thank Sarah for reading this book with me. She's thoughtful and insightful. And thanks to all of you. I'll see you again tomorrow with even more Willa Cather here on Hannah's Books.